Um, Karen, we, we'll, um, at, at the end of our presentation, we'll have one more little uh, short announcement by Pam, so don't rush away at the end. Um, and meanwhile, here is our program chair. I will do so. Terry is a STEAM education specialist, which stands for science, technology, engineering, arts, and math, curriculum developer, California naturalist, and pollinator steward, with a passion for teaching all ages about national, natural history. As co-founder of the Pollinator Posse, she appears at events, gathers data, speaks publicly, and visits classrooms to spread the word about the importance and status of pollinators and how to support them. The home garden is designed to demonstrate how human edibles and natural habitat can blend into a beautiful whole. And as an artist, she creates museum displays and striking scale models of butterflies in silk. So without further ado, <laughs> Terry, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. Thank you. So um, we covered most of this in the introduction, but um, I am the co-founder of the Pollinator Posse. Uh, we are a small grassroots volunteer organization. Nobody gets paid. There's really two of us and some volunteers. Um, and we've been in operation, I think, I'm thinking on the way over, I think it's about 13 years. Um, and if you said and told me this is what I'd be doing in retirement, I probably wouldn't have believed you. Um, the thing I want to add, uh, we mentioned all of these things except the last point on here, which is that I'm a grandparent, which honestly, I think that's the reason I do what I do in my retirement. Um, so the Posse, we are, as I said, we're small, but we collaborate with a lot of organizations. Um, we're a modern joint venture partner, which is a national coalition of conservation organizations, um, but we work with a lot of different groups. And our focus is working in partnership to develop stewards of our local ecosystems. Um, so, um, all right. So outreach is a big part of my focus in the Posse. Um, there's, somebody asked about the butterflies. This is them in the windows at the Nature Center in Oakland. Um, so we do a lot of events. We're out talking to people like this. We do podcasts. We do recordings. There's lots of great information on our website. Um, education. Been at that top. Or there it goes. Okay. Um, education is another big part of it. Um, I think we have recorded lessons. Uh, we're out talking to people. My interview tour at Rocha is really effective talking to landscapers because putting in qualitator habitat is kind of easy. Keeping it going is not if you have mom and blow guys. So that's one of the things that she does. Um, and then community science has become a big part of what I do. And I'll be talking about what's been happening with the monarchs over time. Um, but when that started happening, we needed to start recording it for scientists so it could be studied, and I kind of got backed into that job. And then we also do a lot of um, habitat work, working with groups to establish habitat. Um, I have some milkweed seeds here with me today if anybody wants them. Um, we do seed distribution through libraries and events, and we help people with gardens. Um, our website is pretty extensive, and anything I cover today, you can probably find on the website. You can also contact me through the website. Just the contact form is an email to me. So if you have questions after today, feel free to do that. You can also sign up for our, our email list. And trust me, I don't have time to spam you, so you'll get very <laughs> occasional emails if you do. Um, and if you're interested in volunteering with us, that's where volunteer opportunities come up. We'd love to have people come out and work at events for two hours. You don't need any training. And uh, it's fun. It's often working with kids. We're also on social media. Um, we have a pretty active Facebook group and email or um, Instagram. Um, we, we don't have to TikTok. Probably doesn't bother any of you. <laughs> 
So why focus on pollinators? This is a really good question. Um, I have always been a plant person. I'm, you know, the kid who brought home moss from the field nearby and grew it. I see nodding heads. I'm with my people here and grew it on the refrigerator, much to my parents' total puzzlement. Um, so I have always loved plants, been into plants. Um, and, you know, if we want plants, we need the pollinators to have them reproduce. And as I was an elementary teacher, I got into this. I was teaching science at a school where we started raising monarchs. Can't do that anymore, but we did at that time. And um, that was my entry into this world. So I'll start briefly by talking about honeybees, because that's what people always ask about first. I will say honeybees are a domesticated managed species. Um, so, and they have beekeepers looking after them. So we don't talk about them much other than to acknowledge that they're important. <laughs> um, and um, just to give you an idea, the total number of honeybees is increasing because beekeepers breed them. So they're not, they're in no danger of going away. It is harder. They have more and more things that go wrong. And what this graph shows is that beekeepers lose about 40% of their hives every year, but they just breed new queens. So um, it's ongoing. Um, they have lots of problems. A lot of them related to the problems we'll be talking about with other pollinators, um, but they're not in any real danger of going anywhere. And it's a little like saying, um, save the birds by save the chickens. <laughs> They're a domesticated mammal species. What we do talk about are native bees. So native bees, there's 1,600 species in California alone, 4,000 in the US. One species of honeybees, 1,600 species of native bees. And many of them you might not even recognize as bees. Some are teeny, some are huge, some are very dependent on one single plant. Some are much more broad. Um, they don't sting, they don't make hives, and they don't make honey. If I asked you what a bee was, those are the three things you could tell me. They are single moms looking for a place to lay their eggs to carry things on. So yes, we have sympathy for these girls. Um, they need one of two things to do that. They either nest in cavities, so dead stems, holes and logs, things like that, all those things we clean up in our gardens, or they nest in bare dirt. If you think about one of these little bees digging into the dirt, and we've covered it with mulch and weed cloth and asphalt and all those kinds of things. Um, so we don't help them out as gardeners often. They are excellent pollinators. They're actually, Honeybees pollination rate is 5% because they're packing all that pollen on to take back to the hive to support that hive. Native bees, she's, not, she's gonna feed a few eggs. And so you can see, here's the native bee. They just kind of flop in the flower. They have all that um, pollen on them and they really carry it from place to place. So some of them are critical to us. If you want squash, you have to have squash bees. Um, honeybees won't pollinate squash. And in fact, the squash bees are so adapted, local bees, local plant. It's an, it's an American plant. Um, the males sleep in the flowers at night waiting for the working females to come in the morning. So, so um, often I hear from gardeners, you hear about people talking about their squash starting to grow and then it shrivels up and people think it's disease or it's not, it didn't get pollinated. And the plant's going to abort it because it's not going to make seed. So these guys are ground nesters. So you've got to have some bare dirt somewhere for them to nest if you want to have them in your garden. Tomatoes have to, are pollinated by buzz pollination, which is what bumblebees do. Um, what happens is the bee goes up to the flower and hangs underneath. And if you're standing there, you can actually listen to this and hear it happen. The buzz of the bee goes, it gets to a certain frequency and the flower releases the pollen. You can see it happen. So we have to have bumblebees. And there are also, there are native bees for tomatoes. 
So those are just two examples of the 1600s. I don't know all 1600. Um, and here you see, you can see this poor little bee digging a hole in the ground. So leaving some place, some place in your garden in the back with some bare loose dirt for these gals is really important. And then you can see um, that's a mason bee heading into a cavity to lay her eggs. So we talk to rose societies a lot. And you know, rosarians are super picky about their plants. Um, and um, one of the messages I have to give, this is a leaf cutter bee. When you see those round holes in your leaves, this is this leaf, what she's doing is she makes these little packages inside these holes. She goes in, she makes a package, and then she lays one egg and a little bit of food, closes it up, another, another, another. So we can think of these as damage, or we can think of them as baby blankets. <laughs> I don't know how many rosarians I have uh, convinced with that. But here you can see what she's doing. This is a leaf cutter at the top. Each of those little packages has an egg and a little bit of food in it for the larva. Some of the bees use tree resin, some of them use mud, but that's what's happening inside those little tubes. So this is a map of wild bees in America. The yellow areas are where the counts are extremely low. And you can see it totally corresponds to where we do agriculture. So we're eliminating their habitat um, and we need to reconsider that. So what we've done, this is at the Gardens of Lake Merritt. This is the Bee Hotel or the Airbnb. We actually we had Airbnb volunteers in the garden one day and they were like, we don't do hotels. <laughs> so um, this is actually, this has been a real learning experience for us. It's beautiful. It's great for outreach. People ask about it. You know, we can put signage on it. The problem is it's a super spreader. <laughs> you don't want to concentrate them all in one place because you pull in all the predators and disease. So doing the same thing, but dispersing it um, is a good way to go. So um, if you haven't seen the movie, My Garden of a Thousand Bees, it's on PBS, it's linked on our website. It is well worth your 50 minutes. You will fall in love. Um, both with the guy who filmed it and the bees. Um, so I highly recommend that if you want to learn more. It's one of David Attenborough's cinematographers filmed it during COVID when he was stuck at home. Fascinating. But these are kind of other options. You can go rustic, some holes, or you can get fancier, but putting this kind of habitat in your garden is really valuable for the uh, cavity nesters. And then this is what a bumblebee nest looks like. They do, uh, bumblebees do have maybe 20 or 30 bees together. It's not a hive, but um, most of them are solitary. Um, so this is what's happening. So leaving a place for that to happen is really important. So there are places in the world where the bees have been wiped out and the people have to go out with paintbrushes and pollinate fruit trees. Um, first of all, I don't know where we find people to do this. And second of all, humans aren't very good at it. It doesn't seem as effective. One of the solutions we've heard about is you may have seen these um, electronic bees somebody's working on. Well, let's think about that for a minute. We have made the environment so toxic that bees can't live in it. And then we're going to send out a robot bee to pollinate our food. I don't think these are the directions we want to go. So um, another pollinator I am particularly fond of, which no one ever talks about, are these surfeit or hoverflies. You've probably seen them. They look a lot like bees. They're often bee mimics. And they're the ones that fly like this in your garden, where you see them hovering. Um, oops. The adults are excellent pollinators. They're second only to bees. And their larvae eat aphids. So don't we want these guys in the garden? So you bring these guys in, 
this is one of their larvae, and their larvae are vicious. <laughs> I've seen a video of them going after aphids. One larva will eat up to 400 aphids. So if you bring these in to your garden, you have the flowers they like, which have to be basilia particularly, then you're getting that whole benefit. So butterflies, everybody always wants to talk about the butterflies. And these are our most common local ones. Of course, the monarch, which I'll go into more detail, cabbage whites, the two swallow, well, the three swallowtails, and gulf fritillaries. But I also want to mention moths. Do you know there's actually nine times as many moths as there are butterflies? Um, super important. Usually they they look really, these are pretty ones, but usually they look really dull and they fly in the evening or at night, so we don't see them. But they're super critical to the ecosystem. So when I'm talking about this, I'm including moths in this as well. But of course, monarchs are our poster child. They have whole national organizations dedicated to them. We know more about them than any of the other butterflies, although there's still tons to learn. Um, and they are representative of butterflies in general in that Art Shapiro, who's um, been studying um, butterflies and moths across California for the last 50 years, goes out every week to 10 sites across California. So it's this incredible database. What he tells us is monarchs are kind of in the middle. Half the butterflies are doing better and half are doing worse. So they're a good model in that regard as well. So, but we have to keep our perspective. Um, you know, humans, we pick the monarchs and we fall in love with them and we do everything to protect the monarchs. Um, and then, you know, the poor aphids. We're like, it actually turns out, I have a whole talk on how aphids actually contribute more to the ecosystem than monarchs do, um, but which I won't go into in detail today, but they feed a whole lot of things that we need, including surface flies. Um, but, you know, we get really focused on the monarchs. It's a system. We have to accept it as a system. So you've probably seen these kinds of headlines in the news about the monarch population failing. And then more recently, you've probably seen headlines implying that it's recovering. So I'll talk to you about what the details are about that. But whenever we talk about butterflies and moths, we have to think about the life cycle because they need different things at different times. And if we only provide time stuff for one stage, we don't get the other stage. So um, you start with your adult, it lays an egg. Um, in this case, I'm something called a host plant, which is the only plant that um, caterpillar can eat. So it's gonna lay the egg, the egg is gonna hatch out into a caterpillar, the larva stage. And then that larva is gonna go into the pupa stage, which if you're a butterfly, that's a chrysalis. If you're a moth, that's a cocoon. And then out of that comes the adult. So caterpillars are these incredibly picky eaters. Every species has a plant or a plant family that's all the caterpillar can eat. So we, we can put all the nectar we want out, which we should, but if we don't have those host, what we call the host plants, we don't, we, we're broken the life cycle. So for our local butterflies, um, everybody's heard about milkweed for the monarchs, but um, those painted ladies eat mallows, thistles. Um, the anna swallowtail eats fennel. They used to eat angelica, which is native, but it's adapted to the fennel. Um, we've got gopher liars on passion vine. We've got cabbage whites on the brassica family. And then the buckeye eats these plantain could be toad flax, weeds, but very important <laughs> weeds. Um, and then we have the pipevine swallowtail that eats pipevine. So one example of that weed situation, this is pellitory, probably all familiar with it in your garden, tends to grow along the um, foundation. The leaves are like Velcro, they stick to you. Um, it's a pretty well behaved weed. Well, it's the host plant for this red admiral butterfly. And when I realized this, I thought, oh, well, that little bit of pellitory could stay over in that corner. And now I have these butterflies in my garden. So just, you know, we can give them their space, right? Um, pipevine, um, for those of you Berkeley and North, 
you have pipeline swallowtails around. For us in Oakland, they've been gone for about 50 years. Um, pipeline is a native plant. It, it gets its name from these flowers that look kind of like the old fashioned pipes. It's a really nicely well-behaved body. And um, it was in the creek beds primarily. Well, what did we do with the creek beds? What's left of them are full of ivy. And so we lost this butterfly. And so we've had a project going for about 10 years in Oakland where we've been encouraging people to plant and mapping where the plants are. And I've actually had them in my garden now for the last four years. So we can have that effect. If we plant it, they'll come back. Nope, I did that. So just to show you, this is what a monarch egg looks like. It takes about four to eight days to hatch. This is under an electron microscope. And you know, the theme today is very feminist, I will say. So I just recently learned these um, kind of pores on the egg. The female monarch mates with some males, and they actually, in addition to sperm, they give her a packet of nutrients and things. She stores those up, and when she goes to lay an egg, she chooses which one to fertilize with. I don't know how, but she does. So, you know, it's incredibly complex. So then you have your, out of that um, egg hatches the caterpillar. Caterpillars grow 2,000 times its size in three to four weeks. So if you had a 10 pound baby, that's a 20,000 pound baby in a month. <laughs> and during that phase, they're accumulating most of the nutrients they need for the whole life. Once they're a butterfly, all they're gonna do is drink nectar, they're gonna get sugar. So all the proteins and fats and things happen during this phase. Um, really spectacular. So they go through five stages. They're growing so fast, they actually outgrow their skin and they have to shed their skin. Um, so we talked about the host plant. So the host plant for monarchs is milkweed. Um, and you know, it's like, oh, isn't that great? Milkweed's toxic and that makes the butterfly toxic and it protects them. This is not cooperation, folks. This, this is war. The milkweed developed the toxin to protect itself from the caterpillars and the caterpillars adapted to the toxin to store it in their body. So this has been going on for millennia, this back and forth. It's actually somewhat costly to the caterpillar to do that, to sequester that toxin. Um, so it's only so much. And actually that milky sap, that latex, chokes one third of the caterpillars on their first bite. So this is, it's, it's a balance of each thing protect, you know, doing what it needs to do. Um, the toxin in there is actually, I was just reading last night, it's a form of a steroid, um, which will eventually, it stops your heart if you tap too much of it. Um, there's no real danger of, apparent. I haven't tried this, but I've been told milkweed is so bitter, you couldn't possibly eat enough to hurt yourself. You do have to be careful when you're around it, getting the sap in your eyes is really dangerous. So just beware, um, but you're not, nobody's gonna be poisoned eating milkweed. Uh, this is a blue jay who made the very poor mistake of deciding to eat a monarch and proceeded to barf later. So um, my second grade boys love this slide. <laughs> But um, milkweed only deters some predators. Um, we found um, at the overwintering sites that squirrels and mice have figured out if they eat only the abdomen of the butterfly, that there's not much toxin there. And so this is actually a picture I took at Pacific Grove a couple of years ago, um, underneath the trees where they were overwintering. You see all these abdomenless. <laughs> Uh, but, uh, butterflies, but I mean, those guys got to eat too. Um, there's a parasitic protozoa called OE um, that monarchs get. It's very similar to COVID. It's spread, doesn't kill them all. It's in the population. It's been very interesting to follow. There are parasites. Uh, paper wasps have moved into California in the last 15 or 20 years, and they are um, ruthless. <laughs> Predators, but it's interesting because they um, the paper the adult paper wasps don't eat meat; they eat nectar. But they need um, 
They need the protein to feed the babies. And so they have figured out that most of the toxin is in the digestive tract of the caterpillar. So they, eat, they dissect it and leave behind the digestive tract to take the meat back to their babies. So, I mean, they got to live too. Um, but people have become very concerned about that. Um, and then there's a bunch of viruses and things that they can also get. Um, so on, well, I do want to go back and talk about OE for a minute. So OE is this disease that's unique to monarchs and a few other butterflies related to them. Um, and how it's transferred is an infected butterfly lands on a milkweed plant and leaves behind spores. Think of glitter on the plant. And then the caterpillar that eats that plant ingests the spores and is then infected. Now they don't all die. Um, and this is one of the reasons that they migrate. If you spread out, you don't, you don't accumulate this. And this is one of the things we're finding um, where people just only plant milkweed, nothing else, then it becomes a pocket. It's that super spreader idea again. You want to disperse it in among flowers and other things. Um, the other place it comes up is when we talk about tropical milkweed. And I'll talk a little bit about more of that in a minute. But so the plant is the vector for the disease. So if you have a longer a plant is growing, the more likely it's collected this, that some butterfly has landed who was infected. And the problem with the tropical milkweed is it doesn't go dormant in the winter. So it carries the, the disease from year to year. So that's one of the reasons we encourage people not to use it. So, however, on the milkweed plant, there's a whole bunch of other things that live there. And I can't tell you how many phone calls I get. There are aphids on my milkweed plant. If you have a milkweed plant, you're going to have oleander aphids. They, they are adapted to the plant. But as I said earlier, they actually contribute more to the ecosystem. They don't hurt the plant. They don't hurt the monarchs. And they contribute more to the ecosystem from all the other things they feed than the monarchs do. So learn to love that. Um, but there are also milkweed bugs and two kinds. And here's our serpent fly larva again. And bumblebees will kind of milk the aphids for nectar. There's all sorts of ways that they add to the, the system. And actually a recent study shows that the more other critters on the milkweed plant, the better the monarchs do. It's not a competition, it's a system. And um, we think we know one part of it. Um, and milkweed itself is just this incredible nectar buffet for everybody. And actually monarchs can't pollinate milkweed. It takes a bigger critter. It has a very complex system where it has to pull this whole polonia on and carry it to another one. Um, and so it takes a bigger critter like a bumblebee to do it. So we need all these all these on the milkweed. And the milkweed offers a lot to a lot of different creatures. So as I mentioned, we have this controversy about native versus non-native milkweed, the, um, the tropical milkweed there on the right. Now, I will say, some people say it doesn't matter. This is by far not as big a factor as things like climate change and pesticide use. So it's a smaller issue <laughs> about where we are here. I was just talking to a researcher who says the OE levels in the population around the Bay Area are now at 70% because we have some, and tropical milkweed is a huge contributor to that. So um, these are the natives, these are the good guys. Narrow leaf, which is probably the easiest to grow. That's what I have seeds for here at Speciosa. Californica, you would be hard pressed to find, but we're hoping to get it out because the monarchs are coming out earlier, earlier in the spring. And then, like they're out right now, they've come out of the overwintering sites. And my milkweed's about this tall. And they need to, they want to lay eggs and start their first generation. Californica is up right now. And we think that's what traditionally they use. It's hard to propagate those. So there's a huge project going in California to figure out how to propagate this and get it out into commercial production to help us with that climate change effect. And then there's also cordifolia. Notice that all the natives 
have a whitish pinkish flower. So there's your tip. Um, the non-natives, we've got the two tropical, the orange and yellow one and the yellow one. And then there's another one, balloon plant, which is from South Africa. It also has white flowers, but it's very tall, much thicker leaves. And um, if you see the seed pods, you can't miss it. It has lots of cute names like family jewels and hairy balls. Um, and it's, it has the same issue. These don't go dormant in the winter. And so that OE accumulates. And the other thing it does is bonnards shouldn't be breeding in the winter when it's cold. But if this is available, sometimes they do. And so then they used up their eggs during a cold time of the year and, and it doesn't, it's not productive. So we totally, here's, so natives, basically my message is you can't go wrong planting pesticide-free native And if you have a non-native, at the very least, cut it back frequently although it shows even if you do that, the OE levels tend to be higher. Um, and if, you, if at all possible, replace it with the name. Um, so after our caterpillar has gorged himself for, or herself for three or four weeks, um, it goes into this pre-pupa state. And what's happening is um, butterflies actually make that chrysalis inside their body. So what's happening inside that skin is it's reforming itself and turning completely to liquid. And this is how it attaches itself. It makes this silk button at the top, and this is at the top. I mean, they figured out Velcro before we did. Um, so what's happening here in this series of pictures is after two or three days, it's formed that chrysalis inside its skin, and then the skin splits and it wiggles out. And then, it gets to this part, and it doesn't want that icky skin hanging, so it detaches, drops it, and hangs on again. How? How? <laughs> and I've actually never seen this happen, because you can watch them for two days, and then it happens a minute, and you miss it. How did that evolve? I mean, you, how do you do that in steps? <laughs> So this is what the chrysalis looks like. It's actually clear. So what you're seeing at the different stages is what's in there. And you know, this is hemoglyph. It's the green equivalent of blood, basically. It liquefies, um, although there's like a portion of the brain stem and a portion of something else that stays intact. And it actually retains memory. They've shown me that you can do something to a caterpillar and it will remember when it's a butterfly. Um, and then because the chrysalis is clear, when the color comes in about two days before it emerges, then you start to see that happening. Um, and then the butterfly encloses, it doesn't hatch at this point, and that splits open, it drops out, and you can see the abdomen is really distended because all the fluid is in there, and it pumps that into the wings, and then they harden. At the same time, this proboscis, which is now, it used to have chewing parts. Now it's got this long proboscis for getting nectar. It's actually, when it's inside the chrysalis, it's split in two parts and it's wrapped around the side of its head, you know, like a princess Leah hairdo. And um, when in the process of this, it, it unrolls it and zips it together. Because, you know, blowing up your wings isn't enough to be thinking about. Um, so, and so the, it takes about an hour, approximately, and she is ready to fly off and start their mating life. Um, but I want to show some of the other chrysalids because the monarch one is pretty unique. Most of our other chrysalids, if you, if you were trimming or pruning, you would never see this. And into the green waste it would go. And so, um, if you haven't guessed already, we're pretty heavy proponents of messy gardening. Um, leaving these things in the winter, these things are just starting to emerge now. Um, leaving the stuff so they have a place. And maybe you cut it and you lay it on the ground. Um, that's what I often do in my front yard. Um, but leave it there. 
So whoever, if there's some of those little bees living in there, if there's some of these guys, they can have their space too. And it makes mulch. So butterflies drink nectar, you can see that proboscis going down into the flower. And they can actually, they actually taste with their feet. So that's how they know what plant they're on. So one of the things we're really encouraged is year-round nectar. With climate change, um, you know, the seasons for these creatures are getting longer and longer. So these are a few of our favorites. I'll, I'll go through some in a bit um, of things that have floral, lots of floral nectar this time of year and late into the winter. Um, so monarchs are somewhat unique. There are a few other butterflies that, monarch, but that migrate, but nothing like what monarchs do. So that's the other reason I think they catch attention. Um, so there are actually two portions to the migration. And oh, this whole migration was only discovered in 1974 by American scientists. Uh, obviously in, in the indigenous people probably knew well before we did, but um, that's how recent it is. So the monarch population actually is in two parts. We have the Eastern population and the Rockies are the dividing line. And this population just right, well, right now what's happening is they're leaving Mexico and they're, they're landed in Texas. I was in, actually in Austin last week and I saw them. So they're coming north. They have been there since last fall, hanging in the mountains. They, in the winter, <clears throat> because they're insects, they're totally temperature dependent. They're cold. They can't really function when it's cold. So they go to the mountains in Mexico at about 10,000 feet, and they basically refrigerate themselves for the winter. Not too hot, not too cold. And they, they're just dormant. They don't breathe, they don't eat, they just hang in the trees ready to go. Um, spring comes and they fly north into Texas. And by now the milkweed is hopefully coming up and they lay their first round of eggs. And then those will mature and hatch out and go further. And another generation and another generation. Somewhere in four to five generations this fall, they'll have dispersed through the whole Eastern United States all the way up into Canada. And one day, because of day length and temperature change, that last generation that comes out, it's bigger, it's hardier, and all it wants to do is fly to Mexico. And those single butterflies fly all the way back to that spot in Mexico, haven't been there for five generations, and they hang out all winter and into the spring and come out and breathe. How did that evolve? Um, this is what it looks like there in Mexico. They just cover these trees, these fir trees. Um, so that population, they um, count by the acreage they cover in Mexico. So we can see here, um, and of course this counting started after a decline had already been observed. That's what initiated starting the count. So we've seen there's this it's been as high as 45 acres since we started counting. Um, it went down to 1.7 acres in 1314. Um, and then it's hovered here for a while, around two to four. This year, it was 2.2 acres. So all the monarchs for the entire Eastern North America have been or in two acres in Mexico, which, uh, you know, there are, some people are arguing that the population is in trouble. I don't see how you possibly can. Um, so this is an area of great concern. And I actually heard a talk last week, um, someone who's done all the math to calculate the potential for extinction. It's not, a, the butterfly's not gonna go extinct. They're all over the world. They've naturalized other places, but the migration is in jeopardy. And um, his, his, he did all this math <laughs> and determined that we needed to plant 
1.3 billion stems of milkweed across the eastern U.S. in order to guarantee the migration continues. We've done 150 million, but that's not a billion. <laughs> so there are a lot of people working on this, but this is a, this is worrisome. Our Western population, so us here west of the Rockies, they come to the California coast to winter, who wouldn't? Because as we know at the coast, it's not gonna freeze, but it's gonna be chilly. And then we've identified about 300 sites along the coast where they come, some big, some small. But they go through the same process. They're here all winter. And then I think it was about three weeks ago, they pretty much left the overwintering sites. They fly inland. They're looking for milkweed to lay eggs on to start that first generation. The same thing, they disperse through the West over four or five generations, and then they get that day length queue in the fall and then come back to the coast. Um, we don't know if they go to the same place on the coast that their parents did. We do know that they move around sometimes between places on the coast. Um, and we're actually in the process of getting a tagging program together so we can start to get some of these answers. So our Western population, the blue line is the number of sites we monitor. We, this is the Xerxes, Xerxes Society started doing this back in 1997. They actually have a protocol to count the butterflies. So we're not doing it by area, we're doing it by number of butterflies. Um, I've trained in the protocol, but it means standing in the cold and at Thanksgiving for like three hours. And I, I could do that. <laughs> but um, it's very rigorous. It's two people. And if you don't agree, you have to start over. Anyway, it's, it's pretty accurate considering. So in 97, when they started the count, there were 1.2 million um, butterflies that they counted. That was a decline probably from 10 to 20 million before that. Um, and then throughout the years, it's hovered around 200,000 since then. In 2018, we had this crash and it went down to 30,000. And at that point, people, that was what had been kind of predicted as the tipping point for losing the migration in the West. Um, the next year, it was 30,000 again. And then 2020, our favorite year, hit that, it dropped to 2,000 total butterflies. Now it's a little bit misleading because we had a warm winter that year and we actually had some breeding going on outside of the overwintering sites, but still this, we, we thought it was over. And the next year, 250,000. So we're still hanging in at that 250,000. We just got the count this year and it's right around there. We had a good year last year, it was about 330. Um, so it's hanging in. Um, I don't want to anthropomorphize, but I feel like the monarch said, well, they said 30,000, let's drop to 30,000 and see what happens. And you know what? A lot of money got, a lot of conversation got started and there's money flowing for conservation. And they said, well, I don't think that got any potential. Let's try 2,000. And then the next year they said, okay, Let's just show them they don't know what the heck is going on. <laughs> so we'll see, but it gives us time. It's back, it's at a point where we can do it. So this is Pacific Grove in December of 21. In 1920, there were zero butterflies at Pacific Grove, zero. Um, 21, there were 14,000. This year, I think there were about eight. Um, and we were working with the Washington Post reporter that year, and I got to go into the Grove. They get to go places. We mortals don't get to go. Um, and I got to go into the Grove with her um, and see them up close. Fun story. I was out doing this talk at a nursery in San Leandro in 22. And somebody in the audience said, well, you know, the county butterflies, have you looked at that park in Alameda where there's a bunch of butterflies? And I said, no, let me check on that. So I went and it wasn't an identified site. Um, and I went out to look and I contacted the Xerxes folks. And we have a new overwintering site at Lincoln Park in Alameda. So keep your eyes peeled. 
Um, and interestingly enough, they're in redwood trees there, which we don't usually see. Um, so as I said, because we had these ups and downs in the numbers, um, most of the scientific focus on monarchs had been on the Eastern population. It's way bigger. The, the head scientist on monarchs is in Can they're in Kansas and Minnesota. That's been their focus. It was kind of, oh, those Western ones. When it dropped to 30,000 here, that got her attention. And um, we were here. And we started saying, oh, this weird stuff's happening. They're breeding at other times. And the numbers look weird. And we're seeing this. And of course, you can't just say, in my front yard, to scientists. So I started gathering data to back up what we were seeing. And, and then everybody said, well, you have to keep doing that. Um, so that's the part of what I do. Data. So what's going on? Climate change. California is warming faster than the rest of the country, although I don't know if that's still true with what we're seeing in various places. Um, I think spring has come three weeks early to the eastern U.S. this year. That's what the data is showing. I mean, it's stunning. Um, so we have this synchrony problem, you know, the monarchs, it gets warm in the spring earlier, they come out earlier, the milkweed's not up yet, you know, those kinds of things are happening. And then extreme storms, we have, we've had these late, really rough storms after they leave the overwintering sites um, where they're not as protected in the trees. So that's having an effect. Habitat loss, well, guess who else likes the California coast? Everybody. So those sites, maintaining them, a lot of them are on private land, um, has been a challenge. And then the weather, what's happened is they used to overwinter in Monterey Pines and Cyprus. We planted all this eucalyptus along the coast. They figured out how to use it, um, but um, there's sort of the anti-eucalyptus fire lobby. And so that's been an issue. Um, and then we saw a lot of damage to the overwintering sites this last two years from weather. It's not been great on the coast. Um, and just development throughout agriculture and development that takes out any milkweed. Toxins in the environment. Um, there's insecticides and herbicides and pesticides for sure, um, all of which affect them. And this is a lovely neonicotin. <laughs> so um, especially this, these um, systemic pesticides that we're seeing where plants are treated either at seed or by the nurseries. Um, and then the plant is toxic for its life. And it also leaches into the ground around it. Um, you know, and all the research on that is whether it hurts honeybees or not. Nobody looks at the other creatures. So this is a big area of concern. And I have to say, I just had to um, remove some redwood trees in my yard and re-landscape. And working with my landscaper, I said, I want to know that the native plants we put in have not been treated. I can't tell you how hard that was. The wholesale nurseries, well, one of the things they'll tell you is, well, we don't treat them, but we buy from a bunch of other nurseries that we don't ask. So um, that's the place as consumers we can have effect. Because um, when we talk to the nurseries, they say, well, people won't buy plants that are chewed on or whatever. Well, if you go and you say, no, I'm going to know that plant's not been treated. I don't care if there's a couple bites out of it. Then that will influence the nurseries to insist back down the line. But they're very cagey, especially at the whole typical sale of um, and then we have the non-native milkweed issue, and also a lot of times people think that taking monarch caterpillars in and caring for them uh, is a good thing, and it seems like it is, and we used to do it too. Um, it's actually now illegal in California because of their status, and for good reason. I've spent a lot of time talking to the, the scientists about it, and basically only 5% of eggs make it to adulthood. The others are food for other things, which is great. That's part of the ecosystem. And that we want that 5% to be the healthy, strong 5%. So when we protect the weak caterpillars, where it's, it's helicopter parenting folks, <laughs> we're 
we're preventing them from adapting to changing conditions. And the other thing is often it spreads to feeding and all sorts of other things. So we really don't do well. We discourage it and it is illegal. So, um, but basically people talk about death by a thousand cuts. There's just so much going on in the environment. So what's the plan? This is a large plan that, that for the West in terms of what we want to be doing in um, various zones. Along the coast, we want to provide a rendering habitat. Inland, we want to provide, provide coast plants and nectar plants. Um, as I said, it's illegal now to interfere with monitors in California um, because they've reached a status of species of extreme conservation concern. They're not alone. There's some bumblebees and things in there, but people don't actually want to raise bumblebees or mess with them. Um, so they are protected here in California. They came up for endangered species um, consideration in 2020. And what the Fish and Wildlife Service said at that time is it was warranted but precluded by work on higher priority listing actions. Basically, they deserved it, but there were 160 species ahead of them in line. What's happening though is we think that this decision will come down in the next year or two, that they will be, reach endangered status. And interestingly enough, that has triggered a huge amount of interest in large landowners and land managers. Um, Department of Defense, I was just at this meeting, Department of Defense was there. Um, departments of Transportation who have roadsides through states. Um, power companies who have rights of way. And what's it happened is out of fear of what was going to happen to them, they went, they, they formed a coalition and they went to U.S. Fish and Wildlife and they negotiated a deal whereby if they do mitigation now, they are grandfathered in if this happens. And it's incredible. It's hundreds of millions of acres that are being, they're doing all this research on the best way to, to bring those rights of way, um, bring in native plants, do it with the least herbicide use to get them established, which plants can go where, what can be under the power line, what can be 10 feet out, what should be close to the road, what should be far from the road. It was incredibly encouraging to me to be in these rooms with these people who are talking about this incredible habitat work that they're doing. So this has, whether it happens or not, has triggered a, a huge effort. So this is the meeting I was just at in Austin. 230 people from all over the country. Um, as I said, everything from Department of Defense down to me um, working on this problem. So there are things in the works. To talk now about the bigger picture. So you've probably seen these headlines about insect Armageddon, we're losing our insects. So at this point, um, this study shows that we've lost 41% of our insect population over the past decade. And a lot of these are pollinators, but they all are part of the food web. I mean, this is the graphic I use with my fourth graders, but if you don't have insects, you don't have birds, you don't have the things all the way up the chain. And we're starting to see that effect. Um, this is a study from Cornell Lab of Ornithology that we've lost 2.9 billion birds since 1970. Um, caterpillars are the primary food of birds, nesting birds, and if we aren't providing that. So again, climate change, pesticide loss, all of these things. So it's time to shift the paradigm. Um, we're still often gardening like colonials, right? It's all about conquering the ecosystem. We can do that. And we have to change that to stewardship in our view. Um, this is often how we landscape to a pollinator or an insect that looks like this. And it actually is a minefield because the chemicals we tend to use. So Tora, my partner, was the supervisor at the Gardens at Lake Merritt. Gardens at Lake Merritt is the first wildlife refuge in the United States. Does that look like a wildlife refuge? 
different kind of wildlife. Um, but what she found is when she started putting in pollinator habitat and native habitat, uh, you know, like anything else, her phone rang off the hook. You're not doing your job. How could you vote? Blah, blah, you know. And then she started putting these signs out, and all those same people called her back and thanked her. People want to do the right thing. Um, so we these are some these are actually signs that happen in my yard, and people are always out there looking, uh, talking about it. Um, and I live in Piedmont, where you know, this has not been the theme over time. Um, tidy versus messy. There we go. All right, you can do this, or you can do this. This is my front yard in the spring. Um, I'm probably aware of Doug Talmy and his homegrown national park initiative. I mean, he's done all the math, and we actually, if you haven't heard his talk, there's one linked on our website, it's well worth it. But basically, as a professor, he's done all this math to figure out if we're gonna support the ecosystem, and you take out developed areas for farming and urban life, what's left are our backyards. And that we need that land to be adjusted, to be used um, for habitat. Um, there is the Leave the Leaves initiative, which I'm very fond of. Who loves a leaf blower? Um, so leaving the leaves. All those, some of those um, chrysalids I show you, they wrap themselves in a leaf and they fall to the ground. And so my friend Tori is always saying, so you break up all those leaves, you put them in the green bin, they haul it to the compost center, and then you buy the compost. Leave the leaves, let, let it do what it's gonna do. Often we hear, oh, native plants, pollinator friendly, not beautiful, beg to differ. Uh, this is my front yard when we bought our house. Lawn, not even a good lawn, and eucalyptus trees. This is now. Less water, less work. Really, I do one major pruning a year. This is fruit trees underplanted with pollinator habitat. Um, and my husband doesn't hate me anymore because he doesn't have to mobile. This is the uh, that same section I just showed you. And then this. So I, it just feels like a win-win. So we do um, encourage natives for your um, area, although we are not purists about it. We, we say 80% because there's some great um, plants that give us year-round nectar that aren't necessarily native. Um, and also just a reminder to not forget the annual wildflowers. This is a wildflower mix we've been um, distributing. It comes up like you just throw it out in the fall and this is what you get. That's in the gardens of Lake Merritt. This is in my front yard. Um, so on our website, we have some tools for you. Um, Tora, my partner, who's the habitat person, she's made this list. It's um, pollinator friendly plants, but that shows you what month they bloom and in what color. So if you're designing, you can download this. Um, it's more for the designer friendly side of thing instead of those books that just list the plants. And you're like, well, what's this gonna look like? Calscape, the website is really valuable um, because you can, look at a plant, in this case, I looked at coyote bush. And if you look down at the bottom, these are all the butterflies and moss that are hosted by coyote bush. So that information is there for native plants. An even easier way to get to it is this butterfly net website. This is a, it's uh, in beta testing. It's a grad student who's been working with Doug Tallamy. Um, but what you do, you put in your, zip code and what kind do you want hosted nectar plants? What do you want to do? And kind of what your, um, your habitat is. And it gives you the top plants for that habitat that are gonna support the most wildlife. So lets you be smart about getting the most out of a small area. And like I said, that's linked on our website as well. And I'm just gonna quickly go through this slideshow. It's also on the website. 
So for those of you who want to like, what are the top 10 and what do they look like? This is there for you. So um, we love Tiffonia, Mexican sunflower, technically not native, but close by. Um, and it's, I swear, if you have this, you'll have monarchs. They love this plant. Um, buckwheats are great. This uh, Cape Mallow blooms all year round. So when we're talking about year round uh, nectar, this is a great one. Verbenas, um, this Verbena de la Mina, we talk about it so much, the nurseries keep running out of it. <laughs> but again, year round nectar, super easy. Mexican marigold, I swear you can't kill this. And it's covered in flowers right now. Bulbean. I have this growing in my hell strip and it thrives. Nothing's happy out there. This thrives and the little bees love this. Bacillia, bacillias are great nectar sources and this is one of the things those um, hoverflies love. Uh, Fleabane, uh, Erichiron, and salvias, of course. Pinstones, I think that's how you spell. Cosmos. So those are our top, and that, as I said, that slideshow, you can just download it. So what do we do? Anything we can about climate change, I heard you talking about climate change plans, whatever we can. Pesticides, and as I said, ask at the nursery. That's where we're gonna have that pressure of the line to those wholesalers who just wanna get the plants out the door. Support organizations like ours, like Circe Society, like Monarch Joint Venture, who are out there funding people to do the work. Uh, provide habitat where you can, and that includes host plants, year-round nectar. I mean, we're pushing nectar even more than host plants these days, because uh, everybody uses that. And it's pretty. Um, and protected habitat, places for them to creep and be where they need. and water source here in California, water source is really critical. And it's important the water source not be splashy. You don't want to drown them. Sort of oozy water sources are really nice. Um, and if you want to contribute to community science, um, there we have some ways on our website you can do that. And then spread the word, join the posse. These are some of the very cool people I get to work with um, who are out there doing the work. Um, and just by being here today, we're now part of the posse. That's how formal we are. Um, so join, spread the word, do something, door pollinators. So that's it. Yeah, sure. Oh, I have one. Okay. Okay. So uh, the B Hotel. The B Hotel at Lake Merritt, you mentioned it's not good to have so many apartments in one place, but if you have a small bee house, how important is it to clean the tubes or replace the tubes? Um, it is really important, um, over, but you have kind of two years because you don't know who's put it in there when. But yeah, more and more we're learning that you need to put the tubes in. And if you're interested, um, we work a lot with crown bees. If you want to buy a bee hotel, do not buy it at Costco, <laughs> where it's made out of cedar, which repels insects. Um, uh, crown bees, which I think is linked on our website, um, has really done the research and the homework on how big they should be, how deep they should be in their cute little houses and they, they sell the tubes to go in them. But also just drilling holes. Somebody will live in it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I've been told they don't like bamboo. Um, and you can actually, the cardboard tubes, you can order them in it. So, um, or from crown bees, but, um, and they're replaced, you know. And so what we're tending to do now is drilling the hole bigger and putting the tube in it so it can be changed out over time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's more like two years because you're not sure when the cycle is, but, you know. 
Yeah, I'm a photographer and I did study a while ago of monarch uh, pathologists, monarch uh, chrysalis students lifespan. And I watched, I uh, camped overnight at the dentist's office on Solano <laughs> because they had the host plant there. Yeah. And uh, I watched it develop and I took a thousand pictures of the chrysalis, it, the butterfly emerging from the chrysalis. And what happened afterward was that the butterfly hung there. The butterfly had to dry out. Um, well, it's really, or whatever it was doing. It's pumping it up and hardening. Yeah. yeah. And um, so it was immovable. Um, it did not move for about an hour. And during that time, I watched um, ichneumonid um, um, insects come and they attacked the um, butterfly and um, they injected the butterfly with their eggs is what they were doing, I found out afterward. And the butterfly flew and then fell on the ground. Mm -hmm. um, and so when you see a um wasps, those are, are in opposition to the monarchs. Well, yeah, we're not, we're, we never know who we're supposed to cheer for, but we just do love those monarchs. <laughs> so, yeah, it's it's a rough world out there in nature. Like I said, only 95% don't make it. So, yeah. We're fine here. It's 10 miles from the ocean coast, and that's just a summary, but I've talked to some of the and say, it's here, but I mean, the rule of thumb, which is hard for them to do, is that where it existed, where it planted. So I can't uh, do it. certainly don't want to do it, which they're not very nice to an overwind site, although we have some overwind sites in the east space. I know, but then, yeah, but I thought I know. Bottom line is that the quality uh, was here, item. so that we're trying to support what the ecosystem did. Oh, well, no, it's fine for them to lay eggs now. As long as it's native milkweed, it doesn't hurt. It's not going to make them breed in the winter. So uh, now they need to lay eggs to get that first generation. It's kind of like um, compounding interest. That first generation is super important because they keep building. No. And that's why we're working on the California Cup. But they're going inland, and actually, these smart girl monarchs can hold on to those eggs until there is milkweed. So, well, that's where I mean, of course, that's the question, and I won't tell you that it, it is uncontroversial because I've seen people come close to blows, frankly. Um, but uh, you know, the uh, when I talk to Xerxes, who are really the science based folks. We're trying to replicate and then, you know, get the Californica out there to compensate, but then it is dormant in the winter too. So, anything else? Thank you so much. You're welcome. You're welcome. Here. So, Terry has wonderfully brought these little packets of milkweed seeds. So I believe everyone is welcome to have those. That's so nice. And just thank you again, Terry, so much. And I'm sure we'll spend time on your website. All right. So uh, we're going to have a little drawing and then we finished. And we've got uh, lots of nice little prizes, some uh, flower arrangements and a couple of other things. And uh, let's get started with that. All right. Rosemary. Hi. Come and pick your pick. 